Bibles then to Deuteronomy chapter 7. And I think uh, Irene has been had that on the screen uh, from the New American Standard Bible. I'm going to be reading from the New King James. But I want to talk to you about our covenant-keeping God. God is a covenant keeper. Can you say amen? God is faithful. He keeps His Word. And the scripture that uh, we're going to start with, Deuteronomy 7, verse 9, says, Therefore know that the Lord your God, He is God. Faith is required in, in that one statement. Without faith we cannot please Him because He that comes to God must believe that He is God. Alright? So know that the Lord your God, He is God. If you're not sure about that, if you're not sure that your God is God, the God, then you need to examine, and if you find out your God isn't the real God, you need to make a change. Amen? There are, uh, there are a lot of religions in the world. There's a, there's a, a plethora of religions. You know what that means, Ruth? Plethora. It means a whole lot. There's a whole lot of religions in the world. And because of that, people are serving and worshiping all kinds of gods. Humanism, I mentioned just before, uh, that humanism makes man God. In other words, uh, people will make stupid statements like, well, I'm going to go to my own kind of heaven. And I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to uh, serve my own God the way I want to serve. And I'm going to live the way I want to live. And, uh, and I'm going to have my own religion. That's humanism. Humanism is when man elevates himself to be God. Good. And, and uh, there are people all around us in civilized society that are serving the God that they've made for themselves or made out of themselves. And so you want to make sure that your God is the one true God, the faithful God who keeps covenant and mercy for a thousand generations who with those who love him and keep his commandments. Our God is the faithful God who keeps covenant and mercy for a thousand generations. That, that's, that's the Bible saying forever. When, when the Bible uses the word thousand, it means unending. It means continually without stopping forever and ever. Thousand in God's in God's mind is eternity. That's why I have a little bit of a problem with people making a doctrine out of thousand year reign. Because in God's mind, a thousand years is forever, and the Scripture says, "Of His kingdom and of His rule, there shall be no end." Jesus is not going to rule for a thousand years and then give it up. That's right. Of His rule there shall be no end. Because the word thousand means forever. Cool. Say, Pastor, how, how do you know that? It's, it's called the rule of first mentions. When the word thousands are mentioned in the Bible in Genesis, it means forever. It means eternal. The rule, Listen, people, the rule of our God is eternal. Amen. And He is faithful forever. He's not faithful for a thousand generations and then after that he's going to be unfaithful. You can't, you can't look at it as a literal 999 plus one years. A thousand generations is forever. A thousand years in God's mind is forever. Amen. And if you don't believe that, you need to correct your theology. You mean you don't believe there's going to be a thousand year millennial reign? I believe the thousand year millennial reign is the unending rule of Jesus on the earth. Well, Pastor, our teachers have always taught us there's a thousand year millennial reign. Well, maybe your teachers need to go back and study the law of first mentions and find out what thousand really means in the book. Amen. I know I lost some people there. They would rather think that the rule of Jesus is going to last a thousand years and He's going to give it up and the devil's going to come back and wreak havoc on the earth. And I would rather think that of His kingdom and of His rule there shall be no end. Amen. I'm going with Isaiah. You can go with uh, you know, Dr. So-and-so and so-and-so who wrote a book. 
You can go with Schofield. You can go with those guys. I'm going to go with what Isaiah said. Of his kingdom there shall be no end. Everlasting kingdom. How can God be faithful beyond a thousand generations if at the end of a thousand generations all of a sudden he becomes unfaithful? See, you give the devil an inch, he'll take a mile. You give the devil that little fact and he'll begin to whittle down your faith and confidence in God until you have faith in God a little bit, but not wholly. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. You need to have confident, full-fledged, told, sold out, absolute, 1,000% confidence in God. Or you're not going to make it in this world we live in. You give on that one little bit and the enemy will tell you that, oh, God has given up where you're concerned. God can't save your unsaved loved one. Amen? You see, I believe, I believe the government is on Jesus' shoulders and He's never going to relinquish it. What do you believe? I didn't. Accept, I didn't intend to get on that hobby horse, but boy, it just it just. You need to study the Bible, read the Bible until you are fully familiar with God's character and His true nature, so that you can't be doctrinalized out of your faith. Now, a lot of people go to seminary and become unbelievers. Because they're 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 listening to Doctor So and So Fuddy Duddy, and he doesn't he's not even saved, and they let him talk them out of their faith. Don't do that. That's what the, the, that's what Satan did in the Garden of Eden. He came to Adam and Eve, and he he uh, he just he just planted one little seed of doubt in their minds concerning God's character. God doesn't really want you to have everything He's got. God is mistreating you. God's not fair to you. And that's all they needed to fall from God's, God's uh, uh, His presence and His grace in their lives. Don't let the devil talk you out of, being, of God being who God is. Notice, therefore know, therefore know that the Lord your God, He is God, and He's faithful God who keeps His covenant and mercy unto a thousand generations to them that love Him and keep His commandments. Amen? Numbers 23. You're familiar with this passage of Scripture. Numbers 23, 19. God is not a man that He should lie, nor a son of man that He should repent. Has He said, and will He not do? Or has he spoken, and will he not make it good? Behold, I have received a command to bless. He has blessed, and I cannot reverse it. You see, when God says something, he means it. And when God gives a promise to his people, God will keep his promise. If God said it, God will do it. He's very capable of fulfilling his word. Amen? Then look in Matthew 26 and we'll see where Jesus is also a covenant maker. How many of you believe that Jesus is God in the flesh? And so we see that Jesus is a covenant maker. Uh, in Matthew 26 verse 27, at the last supper he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it unto them saying, drink from it all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant I think uh, King James puts it testament. Testament is the same as covenant. For this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remissions of sins. And we have celebrated that covenant that Jesus made ever since then. It's one of the, uh, uh, one of the command uh, institutions in the church. You know, uh, we, we, uh, we take communion as, as often as you do that you do this in remembrance of me. We take communion often here. Um, not every Sunday, but... And by the way, the reason we don't take communion every Sunday right now is so many people are going to those pre-done pre cups that every time you order them, they're on back order. 
And so, it, you know, since COVID, everybody's been using those cups and now they're on back order. So we may have to, we may have to resort to using the old pour, you know, the, the old method where you pour the juice in the little cup and you, and you break the bread. And, you know, we're, we're not above doing that. But uh, 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 we, we, like to, we like to take communion regularly because Jesus commanded it. He said, do it often. As often as you do this, do it in remembrance of me and, uh, and until he comes. And so even, even the, the Lord's Supper is, is uh, based upon a covenant that God has made with us through the blood of his own son, Jesus Christ. Amen? Now, I want you to, you know, I've, I've, these verses I've just read establish the fact that God is all about covenants. Matter of fact, the, the book of Genesis could be called the book of covenants because you'll see many different covenants made by God with men in the book of Genesis. We're going to look at some of those. But uh, I want you to understand and comprehend that, that uh, our God is a covenant-making and a covenant-keeping God up until the current day. And for a thousand generations. In other words, God's not going to change. God is all about making covenant with his people. Absolutely. Amen. Well, man is all about breaking covenants. Uh, look in 2 Timothy 3 1. And I'm, I'm showing you the contrast. God's, God's a faithful covenant keeper, and man is a faithful covenant breaker. He says uh, in 2 Timothy 3 1. But know this, that in the last days perilous times will come, for men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Now, does that describe the general character of the people that are alive in the world today. Now, I want you to look at one verse in the King James Version, 2 Timothy 3.3. 3. Without natural affection, truce breakers. Everybody say truce breakers. A truce breaker is a covenant breaker. Somebody who makes a contract, makes a deal, or makes a treaty and doesn't keep it. False accusers, incontinent, that doesn't mean a physical incontinence. It's talking about people who do not follow through and lack self-control. Fears and despisers of those that are good. So we have, we have the contrast. God is a covenant-making God who keeps His covenants faithfully unto a thousand generations. Man makes covenants but breaks them does not consider them holy, and does not respect the covenants he's made. God, if he gives his word, he's good for his word forever. Man's word is no good. Men sign contracts, give their word, give their bond, uh, make agreements with people, and, uh, and, uh, and, and don't follow through, don't keep their agreements, because they're unfaithful. But God is faithful. So you see that the, the two there don't mix too well. Uh, the covenant-keeping God and the covenant-breaking man are at odds with each other. And who's going to win in that battle, by the way? Who do you think is going to come out on the other end of things smelling good? God will always win. Man will always be crushed beneath the weight of God's judging power. Amen? Amen. All liars, the Bible says in the book of Revelation, shall have their part in the lake of fire. Amen. So if you don't keep your word, you're going to hell. If you're a contract breaker and a covenant breaker, you're going to hell. Hello? You don't hear that much, you know, on CBS, ABC, and all those others, but I'm telling you, that's the way, that's the way it is because of who God is. God is faithful, men are unfaithful, and all unfaithfulness is going to be rewarded. Amen. Amen. In a very negative way. So let's look at what a covenant is. A covenant is a contract, an agreement, or a treaty. 
or a compact. Uh, a contract, how many of you are familiar with contracts? You know, a contract is something that, that states the, uh, you know, the terms uh, and uh, the individuals that are coming into contract. You know, you signed a contract when you uh, bought your house. You signed a contract if you rented a, uh, an apartment. Uh, it basically says that uh, you come into agreement with this other party that you're going to pay, you're going to buy this house for a certain amount, you're going to rent this apartment for a certain amount, and and you're going to abide by these certain terms, and the landlord's going to abide by these certain terms, and you all look at it, you you read the fine print, and you you nod your heads in agreement, and then you sign this contract, and that contract is admissible in a court of law. If any party to that contract breaks the contract, uh, then uh, then you can take them to court and get a judgment and get some compensation of some kind. Contracts are, are very binding things. And then uh, 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 agreement, uh, you know, a covenant is any, any agreement where two parties come together and agree to do something for each other. A treaty is usually something that's, that's a, a contract between nations or between groups of people. You, you know, you're at war with each other and you decide you're tired of being at war with each other and, uh, and you run out of money and you can't fight anymore. And you raise the white flag and you make, you know, you have a little confab and, and you make a treaty and you determine what the terms of your surrender are going to be or, the, or your enemy's surrender and you determine who, who's going to get what, how the land's going to be carved up, all that kind of stuff. It's all in the treaty. And there have been many treaties over the, over the centuries between nations. And some have held up, and, and uh, many have been broken. That's why you had World War One, and a few years later you had World War Two, because World War One's treaty was violated, and World War Two had to be fought. And then there was a treaty at the end of that, and then there's other treaties that come along, and uh, and treaties are are enforced by armies and by weaponry. If you break this treaty, we've got this uh, we've got this stockpile of bombs that we're going to drop on your head. Amen? And that enforces the treaty and makes the person say, well, I don't want to break that treaty. I don't want those bombs dropped on my head. Amen. But that's a covenant. That's a type of covenant. Then you have a, a, something called a compact. Remember the, how you remember the uh, study in the Mayflower Compact? In, uh, in American history, that's when the, the Mayflower, a ship that came over from from uh, Europe came over, and, and before they landed there in, in uh, Massachusetts, they, uh, they made this compact. When we land and we walk on the shore of this new continent, and we start our new lives, we're going to govern ourselves by these rules. And everybody on that ship signed the Mayflower Compact, and it became a basis for our, our nation. And it's one of the first founding documents of the United States of America. But it was between some Christians on board a ship called the Mayflower, and these Christians had determined that, that when they when they landed on shore, that they were going to dedicate the land to God and to the gospel of Jesus Christ. You should read that once in a while. It's really inspiring. It's like it's like you know uh, they had a church meeting there on the boat, and but they all came to agreement and they signed a compact. What happened? They made a covenant with each other. But not only with each other, they made that covenant with God Himself. And that's how come we can say, truthfully say, historically correct, say this country was founded on the gospel and was dedicated to God in the very beginning. What man's done with it since then, is, you know, there have been a lot of truce breakers and compact breakers come along afterwards, but the initial founding documents of this country were compacts where we came into an agreement that this land was God's land and the gospel would be would be promoted here Amen. without persecution and and that, that people would not be um, uh, persecuted for their religious beliefs. Amen. So that's how this country started and God being a God who honors compacts, he honors covenants, has blessed this nation I believe God has blessed America based upon the Mayflower Compact and other such agreements that men made with Him in the beginning. 
You see, God is faithful to keep co keep covenants uh, generation after generation after generation. Man may break them, but not God. And that's why America is as blessed as it is because there's always been a remnant of people in this country who honored the compact. God has His people in the United States of America. And that's what's keeping it afloat in spite of all the reasons why it should be going down the tubes. Amen. You need, to, you need to stay with the one that floats your boat. Can you say amen? Praise God. Nelson's Bible Dictionary and uh, other, other, other Bible dictionaries say that uh, uh, a, a covenant is based upon a word that means to cut. So basically you're cutting an agreement. And, uh, and uh, this word cut uh, means to cut the flesh. In the Bible, covenants were made and sealed in blood. Originally, they were sealed in the blood of animals in the very beginning. God in the book of Genesis, you know, when he made a covenant with Adam and Eve, he, uh, he, he killed some animals, shed these, these animals' blood, and made skins out of them for Adam and Eve because they were naked. God... God was the first person to shed blood. And He did it in order to cover the sins of Adam and Eve, to cover their nakedness. And so that, that word covenant uh, stems from a word barith, which means to cut. All through the book of Genesis, you'll see God making covenants with men. And in that process, somewhere in the process of making that, co uh, that covenant, blood was shed. And it was a cut. And it was usually uh, 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 sacrificial animals, but there, there was a, a few times that, that man had to cut his own flesh as in the case of circumcision. Circumcision was a cutting of the flesh in order to make a covenant with God during the time of Moses. And, uh, and so we need to uh, uh, thank God. He doesn't require that of us today. Amen? Now... Uh, the New Unger's Bible Dictionary calls it a cutting. New International Standard Bible Dictionary says it means to cut. And this word, this word, covenant, occurs more than 300 times in Scripture. 300 times. Used to, when I would read in my Bible and I'd come across the word covenant, I'd just skip over it because in my mind, covenant was an Old Testament notion that in my mind I just relegated to the Jews. It's something between God and the Jews and it has nothing to do with me. I'm a, I'm a Gentile and it has nothing to do with me because I'm not a Jew. And so I just dismissed the whole idea of covenant until one day God began to get my attention. And I, I, every time I looked in my Bible, I found the word covenant and I also found it in the New Testament. And I realize that I am an inheritor, an heir of a covenant that God made 4,000 years ago with Abraham. And I got interested in it. You know, when you all of a sudden discover there's an inheritance waiting for you, you want to do, do, do a little digging. Well, I inherited the blessing of Abraham. I inherited something because of the covenant that God made with Abraham. And I wanted to find out what my inheritance was. And when I did find out what my inheritance was, it liberated me from sickness, disease, and a lot of other things because all of a sudden I realized the covenant means I'm redeemed from the curse of the law. Hallelujah. Jesus Himself being made a curse for me that I might be blessed with faithful Abraham. Hallelujah. You see, if the covenant means nothing to you, then your inheritance means nothing to you. And there are many Christians today live their entire lives without, without making one single draw on their inheritance. From the moment they're born again to the moment they die. They may go to heaven. You know, if you're born again, you'll go to heaven. But they miss out on all that is their right to have in this life because they don't understand covenants. I don't want you to miss out on, co on your covenant rights. Can you say praise the Lord? That's why I'm preaching this message today. Uh, uh, let's look at some of the covenants of history outside of the Bible. You see, the idea of making a covenant is not just a Bible idea. I believe God started it, 
And uh, as the world began to grow in population, people began to take that notion of, of blood covenants and cutting agreements with each other. Uh, they began to take it off into their false religions and it began to spring up all over the world. And, uh, and many of our habits and customs are the result of covenant making between people who knew nothing about God. For example, uh, all over Africa, you'll see covenants that are made between tribes of, 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 of African natives that are worshiping uh, false gods. They worship their ancestors. They are all into all kinds of occultism. And yet they have this, they have this uh, code that's based in covenants. And it was discovered, first of all, by a man named Dr. David Livingston. You ever heard of him? Uh, he lived uh, over a century ago, and he's one of the first missionaries to travel into deepest dark Africa, into the central of Africa. And uh, he was a medical doctor, very well, uh, very prominent in England. And he, God got a hold of him and turned him into a medical missionary. And so he sold everything he had and, uh, and left for Africa. And as he's beginning to make his way through Africa, um, he, he had uh, with him, uh, he contracted some kind of a stomach ailment. And so he got him a, a milk goat. And he carried this milk goat with him wherever he went. He would milk the milk goat, drink the goat's milk, and it would, it would calm his stomach. And so it was like his own little permanent medicine cabinet, this little milk goat. And it was a favorite pet of his, and it meant a lot to him. And every morning he got up, he milked, first thing he would do is he'd make his prayers, and he'd talk to the Lord while he's milking his goat. And one day he comes up against kind of a brick wall where he was denied passage into, uh, into uh, certain areas of Africa. And uh, he, he, uh, he met this, in, this uh, native African chieftain. And he was talking about you know, how he wanted to carry the gospel and carry medicine into, deeper into Africa. And this chieftain said, well, I'm, I, I've got a way for you to, uh, to get free passage without you worrying about getting killed. And he handed him a staff. And, and this staff was, uh, was carved. Uh, and all the carvings represented that chief and his kingdom. And, uh, and that, that staff w was recognized all over Africa. This was a fierce warrior chief. And everybody in Africa feared him. And he gave Dr. Livingston his staff. And Dr. Livingston says, well, what can I give you in return? And, and the chief says, I want your gold. And um, Dr. Livingston didn't want to give up his gold. Said, and the chief says, well, you can't have my staff. And so they finally made an agreement, the goat for the staff. And that's where we get that, that phrase, got your goat. You know, you ever heard that, got your goat? Well, that came from Dr. Livingston's milk goat. So the chief got the goat, Livingston got his staff, and didn't really appreciate it until one day he came up against a warring group of cannibalistic headhunter wild men. And, and they, they surrounded him with all their spears out, and he raised that staff up, and they recognized it, and they all backed off, parted, parted and, and gave him, gave him uh, free access. And he was able to go all over places like Zambia and Uganda and Kenya and, uh, uh, you know, the, the central deepest dark Africa and uh, preach the gospel to the point that when he died, uh, they, they took his body home to Westminster Chapel and buried him in Westminster Chapel. And yet he said, uh, he said, bury my heart in Africa. So there's a place there. There's a grave in Livingston, Zambia, right near uh, Victoria Falls, uh, there's a grave where they buried his heart and it says, uh, um, David Livingston, African, a man of Africa, something like that. Uh, and Don Norman has been to that grave on many occasions. And uh, he's also been to Westminster Chapel and seen, uh, seen his tomb there. So he was honored as one who, who spread the gospel, but it all came about because of a covenant. Everybody say covenant. covenant. And uh, back during the back during the you know the primitive times in Europe, when people would get married, 
Uh, they didn't have jewelry. They couldn't afford wedding rings and diamonds and things like that. And so they would go to a, uh, the local blacksmith and he would heat up a, a ring, you know, like a washer of some kind, and get it white hot and slip it on their finger and it would burn their, their, their ring finger. And then he would rub, they would rub soot from, from the, the ashes into that fresh burn and it would permanently make a, a scar on their ring finger. And the only way you could divorce is if you've surrendered your ring finger. Which would cause a lot of people not to, you know, they reconsider. Oh, you want a divorce? Pulled out the knife, you know. But as, as time went on and people got more prosperous, they were able to buy uh, wedding rings. And, and we have, but this custom that we have right now uh, of wearing wedding rings is based upon covenant. Y'all know that because when you got married, you made vows to each other. Well, that's covenant. You came into covenant. Thank God you didn't have to shed blood. But how many of you had communion at your wedding? Yeah, many of us, you know, we, we, uh, we'll, uh, some light candles and others do other things, but, but uh, uh, many will have communion at their wedding and be, because it's honoring the blood of Jesus in their covenant. Amen. When they're virgins, they shed blood in the marriage covenant. Yeah. And that's the, the shedding. Of the yeah. Wedding. What 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 consummates the the wedding? In fact, is the the act of uh, uh, sexual intercourse that that results in blood, and then you become one flesh. It's all it's all rooted in the blood covenant. Can you say? Yeah, I mean, you have to understand that. Okay. Uh, how about uh, how about the act of uh, uh, drinking wine? And then, you know, with the, and, and then clinking the glasses and saying to your health, you clink the glasses. That, that's a type of covenant where you're coming into agreement uh, and saying, you know, uh, I'm in agreement and I, I'm 100% for your health, for your prosperity, for your wealth. And so when, when people clink glasses, it, it's, uh, it, it's got its roots in, in making covenants. Um, Making an agreement and shaking hands. Have you ever done that? Do you know where that came from? you know where the, the, the original shaking of hands in order to seal a covenant originated? It originated in a, a, on a little island called Sicily by a group of people called the Cosa Nostra. We know them better as the Mafia. Do you know that to this day, the Mafia does not like to have signed paper contracts? They would rather seal an, an agreement by shaking hands. And, and, uh, and the, uh, one of the terms of this agreement is, if you break this agreement, if you break this contract, uh, we're going to find you and we're going to gut you with a knife. And so for fear of being gutted, they keep those agreements with each other that were only sealed by shaking hands. Masonics, Masonic lodges, have similar vows. Have you ever tried to? Have you ever tried to get a, a, a real Mason to tell you what goes on in the Masonic lodge and tell you? They won't tell you. You know why? Because when they became a member of the Masonic lodge, they agreed that if they ever revealed what's going on there, they would be submitted to gutting. Just like the Cosa Nostra. So be careful when you shake your hands with a mason. Oh my God. <laughs> Amen. Don't come in don't come in a contract quickly with anybody. Amen. And uh, but uh, I mean th these are things that have come down. H have you ever heard a uh, a practice among Native Americans called blood brothers? You ever heard of that? Where they would uh, something would happen, and two two uh, warring tribes of uh, Indians would come together and decide that they're going to make peace with each other. And the leaders, the chiefs, would cut their hand or their wrist, and they would join hands and mingle their blood. And then they would rub dirt or mud or ashes from the fire to leave a permanent scar. And when whenever they saw each other, they would raise that hand and, and they would 
display the sign of their covenant. And there were a lot of uh, white guys, you know, that became friendly with the Indian tribes and they realized the, the, the sacredness of blood brothers and they would make a blood brother covenant with, uh, with Indians and that, that gave them free passage uh, among the Indians where they could, take, they could take wagon trains through, they could take whatever, uh, they could do commerce among the Indians because all they had to do is reveal that they were a blood covenant partner. Amen. When I was a kid, we used to watch westerns, and I remember one called Cochise, where this guy made this guy made a blood, uh, made Cochise, the head of the Apaches, his blood brother, and it saved his life. Why? Because they honor it. One of the big one of the big problems that Native Americans have with with uh, white Americans is. White Americans would make treaties with them and then break the treaties. Because the Native Americans, even though they were heathen and they worshiped false gods and they were into all kinds of occultism, they were reverent when it came to the agreements they made. And they would willing, they would give up their life then to break a, 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 an agreement. Then the white man comes along and he just breaks treaties right and left. You can understand why they didn't have any respect for the white man, and and I speak that to our shame. That's one of the well, that's one of the shameful parts of American history how we treated the native inhabitants. Then we have a, a, the act of selling one's soul to the devil. You know the people actually do that, and they and they do it, they do it with blood. They'll make an agreement with the devil. And then they'll cut themselves and bleed into a, a cup and they'll either pour that over, over an altar of some kind or they'll drink it. They'll drink this blood and they'll offer the devil their soul if the devil will help promote them in this life. And many, there are many people who have confessed and, and testified that they did that and became rock stars, became, became uh, 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 leading in their whatever field of endeavor because they had sold their soul to the devil. But the devil does come collecting. He will promote them. He will, he will honor his commitment for, to a point, and then he wants you to honor your part of the commitment. He comes after your soul. And we, and we have, that kind of leads into all of these other occult rituals where people drink blood, they shed blood. Mormonism is about shedding of blood. I had Brigham Young III actually tell me personally after he got born again and spirit filled and left the Mormon church, he told me that the Mormon religion is based upon the shedding of blood. But not like we think. They believe that if you, are, if you want your sins forgiven, you must shed your own blood. The only way for you to get your sins forgiven is to shed your own blood. You see, they don't honor the blood of Jesus. You got to shed your own blood. Jesus wasn't enough. You got to shed your own blood. He also told me this, and this was like early early 1970s when I met him, and he told me this. He said, "If you really love your neighbor, they teach that if you really love your neighbor, and your neighbor will not shed his own blood for his own sins, you must shed his blood for him." Think about that next time you live next door to a Mormon. Now, a lot of them are not taught that in the local level. But as you get deeper into it, it's kind of like being in the Masons. As you, as you first join the Masons, it sounds like a pretty good fraternity that will help promote you in business and promote you in, in the local community and get you out of trouble whenever you get into trouble. Things like uh, They talk about all the benefits, all the benefits. But the deeper you get into it, the more they realize that they expect you to make a blood oath, and then they've got you. Same way, with, it's the same way with the Mormon Church. The Mormons, the Masons, and the Mafia all operate on the same principles. So that's blood covenants out in you know among the heathen out in the world. 
Let's look at some covenants in the Bible. You already look at a couple Bible covenants. Uh, let's start with the first one, Adam and Eve, Genesis chapter 3. Genesis, you know, how many of you know what happened in Genesis chapter 3? This, this is where Adam and Eve bit the dust. It's where they said, it was where the great fall is recorded. I'm not going to get into all that about how it happened. You know how it happened. But I want to look at verse 15. God is pronouncing a curse over the snake, the serpent. And he makes a he, and he makes a prophecy. God prophesies. Genesis 3:15, he says, I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. And her seed, the, the S there is capitalized which means it's the name of somebody. And we know that her seed, the seed of the woman, is Jesus. Because in in the in natural course of life, the man is the one who bears the seed and passes on the seed. But where Mary was concerned, she did not receive a man's seed. She received her seed from God himself. And so her offspring was the, was the seed of the woman. And so this is a prophecy concerning Jesus. And he says, I'll put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed, and he shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. Notice, her seed is a he. I'll tell you what, in this day and age when they're trying to get rid of personal pronouns, you got to resist that. Or you won't even understand the Bible. God is a he. Jesus is a he. Amen? He shall bruise your head. He's talking to the serpent. Jesus, the seed, will bruise your head. That word bruise there means to crush it to death. He will kill your head. And you shall bruise his heel. Now we know that the serpent represents Satan. And the serpent's seed represents Satan's offspring. And so what we see here is a prophecy and really a covenant made between God and the devil saying the seed of the woman is going to crush your head. You're going to wound his heel. The heel will heal. The heel will heal. But your head will not. You're going to be defeated. He was prophesying and making a covenant to defeat Satan. Then in Genesis 3.21 we see where God also uh, for Adam and his wife, the Lord God made tunics of skin and clothed them. God killed some animals, shed some blood, and clothed Adam and Eve to cover their nakedness. So here, here's two covenants, really. The covenant between God and the serpent, and the covenant between Adam and Eve and God, where God killed animals and covered their sin. In other words, God says... God really is prophesying the day will come when I'll offer a permanent sacrifice and His blood will eradicate your sin. You'll see the prophecies in this. Then you go to the next chapter, Genesis chapter 4, and you see God making a covenant with Cain. Look at Genesis 4.10. Now, how many of you remember the story of Cain and Abel, how Cain killed his brother Abel? Okay. And uh, Genesis 4.10 and he said, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. You see, blood has a voice. Blood speaks. Now you may not hear it, but God does. There's life in the blood. And, and the blood speaks. And this is important because Cain's blood, I mean Abel's blood, was the first blood of a human that was shed in human history. And he was killed by his own brother, murdered by his own brother in a jealousy fit of rage. And God said, I hear your brother's blood crying out to me from the ground. So now you are cursed from the earth which has opened up its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you till the ground, it shall no longer yield its strength to you. 
a fugitive and a vagabond, you shall be on the earth. Now, this is pretty serious. In other words, God was telling Cain, because your brother's blood is in the earth, the earth will not respond to you. And Cain said to the Lord, My punishment is greater than I can bear. Surely you have driven me out this day from the face of the ground. I shall be hidden from your face. I shall be a fugitive and a vagabond on the earth. And it will happen that anyone who finds me will kill me. The King James says, Everyone who finds me will kill me. Amen. And I always thought that was interesting translation because they can only kill you once. How can everybody kill you? But uh, the New King James changes it to um, it will happen that anyone who finds me will kill me. So it's kind of like the first one who finds me is going to kill me. And the Lord said to him, Therefore, whoever kills Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord set a mark on Cain, lest anyone finding him should kill him. So God branded Cain, put a mark on him. And we don't know what that mark looked like. We don't know where it was. Probably right in his forehead, you know, the mark of Cain. But that's what preserved Cain's life. You know that that was a covenant between God and Cain. That even, even in God's judgment on Cain, God showed Cain mercy and allowed him to live out his life a vagabond and a fugitive but did not, did not allow him to be killed. So God did have mercy on him. That's a covenant. Amen. God, God made a covenant with, it, with Cain. Can you believe that? Amen. And then there's Noah. Let's look at Noah. Genesis 9, verse 8. Are y'all interested in this? I told you that the book of Genesis is the book of covenants. You know about this one, Noah. Genesis 9, 8, that God spoke to Noah and his sons with him, saying, And as for me, behold, I establish my covenant with you and your descendants after you. What did Noah do the moment he came out of the ark? He did an animal sacrifice to the Lord. It was at that sacrifice where blood was shed that God makes this, co this, this uh, covenant. He says, Thus I establish my covenant with you. Never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of the flood. Never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. And God said, This is the sign of the covenant which I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for perpetual generations. I set my rainbow in the cloud and it shall be for the sign of the covenant between me and the earth. So God's making a covenant between himself and the earth and everyone that's living there. It shall be when I bring a cloud over the earth that the rainbow shall be seen in the cloud. And I will remember my covenant which is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. The waters shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. The rainbow shall be in the cloud, and I will look on it to remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is on the earth. Let's not let the, uh, the, the queer homosexual crowd steal the rainbow from us. Because it's a sign of covenant that God gave us. But I want you to notice something here. The, the rainbow exists in the cloud for God's benefit. Amen. Notice what he says. He says, the rainbow shall be in the cloud and I will look on it. And when I look on it, I'll remember the everlasting covenant that I made. So the rainbow is there for you to look up and be comforted and to be reminded that our God is a God who makes covenants and keeps them forever. But it's also there to remind God. God chooses to remind Himself that He's made a covenant with the earth. And every time God looks down through the clouds, He sees the rainbow. And I believe He sees a complete circle. Because you know, if you get up high enough, 
like in an airplane 30,000 feet, you see a rainbow, you see a complete circle. Down here on the earth, we only see like a half circle or a third of a circle. But I believe from God's vantage point, He sees the whole circle. And a circle stands for forever. And it reminds God that He's got a forever covenant with the earth that He will not destroy it again with a flood. Amen. That's good stuff. Where else does God remind Himself? Well, every time the Bible, you know, where the Bible says, let every man lift up holy hands without wrath and doubting. When we lift our hands up before the Lord, Jesus in heaven stands up and lifts his nail scarred hands up before the Father. And the Father sees the nail prints in Jesus' hands and he's reminded of his covenant with us. Amen. When we lift up our, hand, our holy hands without wrath and doubting, we're showing God we are believers in the covenant. Yes, it's a sign of surrender, but it's also a sign of covenant. Amen? Amen. Why else do you think God permitted His Son to retain those scars? It's a reminder for God. It's a reminder for us that we have a covenant that is forever and cannot be broken. Can you praise the Lord for that? Circumcision, we're going to look at that again later, maybe next week. Uh, we're going to look at circumcision as a sign of the covenant. It's, it's big, man. It's huge. And then uh, all through the Old Testament, we see God reaffirming His covenants with people. You know, He made a covenant with Abraham, and then He reaffirmed that covenant with Isaac. And then when Isaac uh, passed the family over to Jacob, God visits Jacob and reaffirms his covenant with Jacob. And then later, when God meets with Moses at the burning bush, God speaks of the covenant that he made with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And what God did for the Israelites in Egypt was on the basis of that covenant that he had made with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So God, this is, this is a, a perfect example of God honoring his covenant and his commitments from one generation to the other. Even though a generation may pass, God honors His covenant with their descendants. Amen. Amen. That, that ought to really bless those of us that are, that are second, third, and fourth generation Christians. So where do we come in? Uh, in all of these covenant things, I, I want to I want to give you three scriptures, and then we'll then we'll close. Look at James chapter two. James two twenty two. And the scripture was fulfilled, which says, Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. You see then that a man is justified by works and not by faith only. Now, if you were here on Wednesday nights, you would understand what all that means. Amen? It's not just your faith that saves us, but it's what you do because you have faith. Your works. And so, uh, a covenant is, is based upon what we do with the agreement we've got with God. Galatians chapter 3, verse 13 says, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. That. Everybody say that. that. That means in order that, or because of that, the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. How many of you have received the Holy Spirit? Did you know that that's because of the covenant? So you're saved by the covenant. You're filled with the Spirit by the covenant. You're healed by the covenant. You're delivered by the covenant. And you're blessed because of the covenant. Look at Ephesians chapter 2. And this will be our last scripture today. But I, I'm going to continue this teaching uh, next week, Lord willing, because I'm just touching, I'm just skimming over the surface. 
There's a lot to this. Ephesians 2.11 says, Therefore remember that you once the Gentiles in the flesh. See, that, that was me. That was me when I disrespected the whole idea of covenant. I was a Gentile in the flesh. You, once Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, made in the flesh by hands, that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. That's who we were. Hopeless, godless, covenantless, helpless. But now, everybody say, but now, in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. That's the covenant. I'm no longer a stranger and a foreigner. I'm a son and a citizen. And so are you. Amen. Stand up with me. Lift up your hands to the Lord. Make some kind of a joyful sound. Amen. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Knowledge of the covenant and an understanding of how I have a covenant with God that's sealed in the blood of His own Son has literally saved my life on a number of occasions. And it'll save yours. Hallelujah. Father, we just stand here before You as recipients of a deal that You made 2,000 years ago when Jesus allowed His body to be broken and His blood to be shed. to bring into reality a new covenant, a new agreement that cannot be broken. We thank You for it. And we receive it today in Jesus' mighty name. Hallelujah. Next Sunday we're going to have communion. I'm going to save communion.